and welcome back uh, to today's plenary session. I hope this afternoon was productive for all of you and you shared uh, great ideas and met interesting people. You would have all seen the amount of exciting things that are going on in the Majlis area, so I hope that you've taken full advantage of that. So let's just wrap up uh, the day, the very first day here, and let's begin by uh, exploring the future of education in an age of groundbreaking innovation. Now, there's no doubt that in the years to come, our lives are going to be transformed in quite a dramatic way in this digital age. Just imagine if you had your meetings uh, using augmented reality and simply by using a bracelet on your wrist. Or an algorithm might hire you for your next job. You might take an online course where the teaching assistant is a chat box. And because of our rapidly changing digital world, there will be brand new industries and services in the near future. I'm sure you know about some of the statistics. 85% of the jobs that are required for 2030 haven't even been invented yet. So, how can education prepare us for all of this in our ever-changing world? In a moment, we'll have our expert panel addressing all of this. But first, let me try something with you. Given we're talking about new technology, we've given you all some cards with yes and no on them. I sh I'm sure you have them with you. The red card uh, means no, and the green card means yes. You've, you've got them all there with you, great. We're going to try something. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, and uh, I'd like you to hold up these cards. So you ready? Okay, so the first one is, do you think a driverless car will transport you to WISE in 2022? Oh, wow, there's a mixed, mixed response, but I'm seeing a lot of greens. Okay, this is a huge task now for the people who are creating driverless tasks, uh, cars and for WISE to make this happen for all of you. So that's, that's really interesting. The majority of people think that they're going to turn up uh, in... 2022 in driverless cars. We'll have to ask a few people about whether that's possible. Now let's ask a question about education. Are you optimistic about the extensive use of technology in tomorrow's education? Great, a lot of green. There's a lot of very positive, optimistic people here. Okay, so lots of yeses. Okay, well let's talk more about the future of education. To do this, we've invited one of uh, the world's greatest visionary engineers and entrepreneurs. He created what is now the world's largest massive open online course, or MOOC platform, Udacity. It offers world-class higher education in an accessible, affordable, and flexible way, and it really is a breakthrough. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on stage Sebastian Thrun. Great to see you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so honored and delighted to be here. I just came from Silicon Valley and something amazing has just happened. Artificial intelligence, progress in AI. AI as a discipline is 60 years old and for most parts had very little impact. But the last year, has been transformational. In March 2016, AlphaGo by Google beat the world's best Go player. Later that year, IBM Watson proved it could do certain lawyers' jobs better than lawyers, in particular document discovery in litigation. Earlier this year, a team from Stanford, of which I was part, showed that AI can find skin cancer in images more accurately than the best human physicians, Stanford board-certified dermatologist, and that is just the beginning. AI is a technology that is poised to transform every aspect of our lives. To give you one example of my own work, 
Back in 2009, I started a team at Google called Chauffeur, and we started building cars that could drive themselves. This is a video from 2010. And had I asked you in 2010, if in 12 years' time, Wise would have a chauffeur bringing you to the conference, you would have all said no. And while the cars back then drove very clumsily, they had a secret weapon. They could learn. They could learn just like we learn. But when you learn and make a driving mistake, you hopefully learn from it and never make that same mistake again. When a Google car learns from driving mistakes, it learns, and so do all the other cars, including all the unborn cars of the future. That means, in principle, AI has the capability to outpace ourselves in learning. And I've come to believe that within the next two decades, almost every repetitive work that we do in offices, be it as an accountant, be it as a lawyer, be it as a pilot, will be augmented by and eventually be replaced by smart machines. And that's not the end. It goes much further. We've made enormous progress on adjacent areas, drug design, cancer treatment, life extension, hopefully a fusion as an energy source, and something else crazy that maybe in a few years' time you're going to have a card for this, uh, which is flying cars. These are drones that are powered by AI that allow everybody to learn how to fly within minutes. And having been stuck in traffic here in Doha, I want one here <laughs> right now. <laughs> With all these advances, the question has become, how can we take the world with us? How can we harvest the potential power of the world? How can we build education and information that is there for everybody? If you look at the universities in the world, um, these are the uh, top 800 universities, of which Qatar University is one. They are growing. There is an enormous pressure on universities to deliver even better education, even faster. But they can't grow at the pace that they should be growing at. There's regions on this map that are completely dark for hundreds of miles, where no one has access to good education. And the imbalance of education is not just geographical. I should mention that Qatar is at the forefront with the visionary uh, universities that you've drawn here, like Carnegie Mellon and others. But the majority of the world, look at Africa, look at South America, look at Canada, look at, at the Soviet Union, uh, Indonesia, many other places, there is a dearth of great universities. And we can't build them fast enough, and we can't train teenagers, uh, teachers fast enough. So if you want to address the imbalance that arises from new technologies that will come and we will not stop, then we have to address the education problem and, and bring education to people. So in 2011, I decided to um, start my own university. Um, at the time, I was uh, running Google X, I was a professor at Stanford, and I was building self-driving cars and Google Glass and a few other things. But it dawned on me that the best impact I could have is to start my own university. And it wasn't meant to be another Stanford or Harvard, another brick and mortar university. No, it was meant to be a global university that would operate worldwide. Now, Harvard was created 150 years ago. Universities are often much older. At the time, there was no such thing as online. But in 2011, we had the internet, we had tablets, we had mobile phones. So it felt logical to use the power of this medium to make a global university. And when I say global, I don't just mean geographically global. There's other imbalances. If you look at the number of students enrolled in their 20s and the number of students enrolled in their 40s, it's only 1% as many students enrolled in their 40s than in their 20s. Some of you have come to believe in this world that education is a one-time thing, and once you have your degree, you're set for life. But that is a myth. We now live longer. Technology moves faster. We have more different careers. In America, the average stay, average tenure in a job is four and a half years now. 
We can't afford a one-time medication. And yet, if you're my age, there is just no options. So by global, I don't just mean geographically global. I mean age global, ethnicity global, gender global, anything global, so we could reach every person on the planet. And that is new because the best universities in the world, like the Harvards and the Yales and the University of Qatar's, pride themselves of exclusivity. The recipe to get stellar students out is to limit the number of students you take in. You cannot imagine MIT opening the floodgates to a million students, or Harvard or Stanford. So this university was meant to be the opposite. It embraces everybody, gives everybody a chance. Here's my video. This is for the dreamers. The forward thinkers. For the innovators. The defiant. For those who dare to imagine the future. Udacity prepares you for the jobs of tomorrow. Learn Silicon Valley skills with a nano degree program. Enroll now at udacity.com. Our first class, our very first class, was a graduate level Stanford class on artificial intelligence. I was teaching the class on campus to 200 students on Stanford campus and decided to take it online. 160,000 students signed up. Hundreds from Qatar, thousands from the Arab world, thousands from China and other places. I was now teaching 160,000 students. That number went down and down to 23,000 finishers and 200 students on Stanford campus. I gave both student groups the same homework assignments and exams so I could compare. And I was really curious, are the best students in the world truly at Stanford? It turned out the top 412 performers were not at Stanford. There were people all around the world. And the single best student in Stanford was ranked number 413. I talked to those students. I sent emails to those students. At some point, I'd send 40,000 your homework is late emails, to which I received 40,000 excuses. <laughs> but the excuses were fascinating. We had soldiers that fought the war in Iraq and Afghanistan who, in the middle of the night, went over to shell and mortar attacks to get their homework done and signed. We had mothers raising children with infants in their hand, trying to get the pass the exam to prove that they're worth something. We had people on the deathbed whose last wish had been to get an iPad and, and live, live long enough to finish the end of the class before they pass away. And then I realized, these aren't your typical Stanford students. Your typical Stanford student is already privileged, is already smart. And lo and behold, if I don't show up to class, they're still going to have a stellar career. But there's so many of us that don't go to Stanford. Why don't we have the same fair chance as those often very rich kids in America? Now, in creating this, I first turned to universities. I felt I'm a technologist. I can find universities to help me build content. And we built content with universities. But it was immediately clear that we had two problems, two massive problems. Number one, the universities weren't always up to date when it comes to technology. Professors tend to teach the same content for decades, but in Silicon Valley, novelty is measured in months. And second, we weren't very popular. In making education university accessible, we made it available for free. And that disrupted the business model of universities. So the unions in California took issue and managed to shut us down. And then we decided we turned to companies. Let's see. Companies like Google, Bosch, Bertelsmann, GitHub, Airbnb, and many, many, many others. Those companies are desperate to hire. 
They want people with machine learning skills, with mobile skills, data science skills, virtual reality skills, cybersecurity skills, and they can't find them. So here we are in the world where 412 brilliant minds outflank every Stanford student, and yet we have companies searching for the same talent with desperation. We have built a number of programs, now it's over 15, all in the tech space, where students come, spend half a year, usually online, sometimes online, offline with us, and they earn a new certificate, which we call nanodegree. We call it nanodegree because degrees are highly regulated. Nanodegrees are not. <laughs> it's a small degree. If, you, if a normal degree is four years, if you do the math correctly, a nanodegree is a second and a half. The certificate is this small. And it wasn't threatening anymore to universities. And these degrees have now job guarantees. We have job partners that give the same treatment to finish as another degrees than you get for uh, conventional degrees. What's even more important is we focus the education purely on jobs. And I'm happy to be critiqued because education is so much more than jobs. But I felt if someone undergoes half a year of training and pays me more than a thousand US dollars, then that person ought to be rewarded with something tangible as a promotion or as a new job. And to accomplish this, we go to our partner companies and say, hey, what would impress you, Mercedes, BMW, Twitter, Amazon, IBM, Google, Facebook? And those companies happily say, here's a list of projects. If a student would just do those, I'd be blown away. And that becomes our curriculum. No professors involved for now, except for me, I guess. Let's look at one in particular. This is a nanodegree we launched a bit over a year ago and has now over 10,000 enrolled students. It is on the topic of self-driving cars. It is the only education in the world on self-driving cars. And as a result, by definition, we teach more students self-driving car skills than all universities in the world combined. It's a hot topic. There's been many recent acquisitions some in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And if you take the acquisition price and divide it by the number of engineers, you'll find that Silicon Valley is happily paying $10 million just to hire one Silicon Valley, one self-driving car engineer. It's a staggering amount of money that speaks to the desperation of Silicon Valley and car companies around the world to get talent like this. Now, we build a curriculum together with about five leading companies, including NVIDIA and Mercedes, and empowered the engineers at those companies to become instructors. And these instructors are rock star instructors. They are known around the world. The classes are attended by millions of non-paying students, and as I mentioned, 10,000 enrolled non degree students. Now, one of the great things you can do in these classes is you can give students challenges. And we make project challenges in these classes that are so hard that I wouldn't know how to solve them myself. One was, we wanted to build a self-driving car using only a camera. If you look at self-driving cars today, the best cars are built by Waymo, formerly Google, and they massively use a, a sensor called laser. A laser is a camera, a specialized camera that uses laser light to understand how far things are away. It's very expensive. It's very accurate. People, in contrast, can drive cars with their eyes only without the capability of understanding how far things are away based on laser light. So one of the questions is, can we reduce the cost of a self-driving car to the cost, effectively, of a car plus a cell phone by moving away from these LiDAR cameras? We give our students um, challenges. We, build, we, we bought our first self-driving car at, at Udacity. We now have 10,000 students writing code that actually is executed on a physical self-driving car around the world. And we give students these challenges. And here's one challenge. If we ask students, from camera images only, can you find lanes reliably on highways? These challenges are open for 48 hours. The accuracy of this student's solution rivals what was able to accomplish at Google 
with about a billion dollars of funding over five years. A second student, thank you. A second student, the same on surface streets. This is something that was believed to be impossible by experts like myself. It's a camera view on a surface street on a mountainous road uh, in the evening, and you can see the long shadows. Can we predict human steering accurately? And again, the same technology that makes it possible to detect cancer in cancer images or beat the world's best Go player is behind this revolution, deep learning, where the students train a computer on data to develop the capability to find a road in images as difficult as the one you're seeing behind me. We gave students the task of finding other objects. And if you let literature, at this point, machines are better in looking at an image and classifying, determining what objects are inside the image than people. We have surpassed the ability in the last two years that a random scene, a random situation for a machine to understand what it sees. This is a machine using camera only to find pedestrians, bicycles, cars, and other objects that are relevant to driving. Again, in my prior work at Google, we used lasers, lidars, that give us precise 3D information, tells exactly where the object is. It's much harder with cameras. But now, thanks to our students, this is a solved problem. In fact, three months into the Nanobi program, we did something crazy. We tossed the best student contribution together into a piece of software and let our car lose. We let it lose in Mountain View, which is about 30 miles south of San Francisco, on a road called El Camino Real, which is a regular street with about 130 traffic lights, and during commute traffic, had to drive all the way to San Francisco. And it did just this, 100% autonomous. These were our students building a self-driving car that now rivals what Google can do. I was completely blown away. That just opens the eyes to me. There's so much talent in the world. Now, going forward, I think we're just beginning. Let me. I think we're just beginning. This is the beginning of a revolution. Education, as so many speakers said today, and as you all passionately believe and what brings you here, is the most important thing on the planet. It ought to be that education, lifelong education, be a basic human right. And when it becomes a basic human right, we have to figure out how to bring great education to everybody, to give everybody the same chance. And I think today it can be done. It can be done. It will be done. We haven't figured out everything. I don't know how to, play, how to teach you how to play the violin or play tennis online yet. There's many, many deficiencies in what we do, what, what other companies do. But the revolution is unstoppable. We now have so many students from the Arab-speaking world. I'm personally proud of every person that enrolls. We have transformed thousands of lives, tens of thousands of lives, gotten people new jobs, and, and, and really have an impact. To give you one data point, uh, we have a program called Nanodegree Plus in North America only, where we promise our students a full tuition refund if they don't find a job within six months of graduation. No questions asked. If you come in and you want to find a job and you change your mind, you get a refund. 90% of our students find jobs, and on average, they make $34,000 extra. And why it isn't the money that I care about, I believe every human being deserves the right to participate, to participate in society constructively and play an active role. And I believe education is key to all this. Thank you. Sebastian, thank you so much for those inspiring words. And, and what a thought to make lifelong learning a basic human right. Thank you so much. If you can uh, join me there on the soft sofa, because I imagine so many of you here have so many questions uh, for Sebastian. We're going to open up to the floor now and take a couple from you. Thank you for a very inspiring speech, and Udacity is, is well known for that. I have just only one question. This is Abu Bakr from Islamic Development Bank. Um, in the Islamic world, as 
the many centuries ago has enlightened the Renaissance in Europe. Now, I think that in Islamic world still have that fire in their belly. It has just not been ignited. How can, but when it comes to education and finding jobs, most of the countries have their own regulation in terms of education certification and also the quality assurances. So that means that can it be, as you said, the education should be global. How can the government overcome that? Obviously, every government wants to control the uh, society and the, their ethics and, and, and their history. But how can that be transformed globally? Thank you, sir. And I believe we had a question down here. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I would like to ask you, as a parent, um, some of uh, some fields becoming absolute and uh, a lot of people are changing their profession so in the next 20 years i mean how would you advise your own kids what to study what advice you would give them thank you very much so we've got two questions there one about governments and how they can governments want to control what they teach people how you can overcome that and also uh, for the younger generation your children what advice would you give them to the future Good. I, more and more governments are realizing that their own people is their biggest potential. And Qatar has been honestly leading the way in, in the Arab world, so has Jordan and, and other countries, um, where I think it's more and more clear that a monopoly on information and doctrine is inferior to openness. We, d we work with governments a lot, um, including some of your uh, less beloved neighbors, I should say, at this moment. Um, we work in countries like New Zealand and China and India, and more and more are we beginning to realize that governments are becoming open towards new versions of, of certification. And our approach has been to really focus on lifelong learners. Lifelong learners I define as people aged 25 and older, say, that are outside, maybe post-college degree, um, and for those individuals, there are very few solutions today. Um, as Udacity, we are completely apolitical, and we're completely focusing on, on tech skills and, and nothing else. So government from all sides of the world have approached us and worked with us. Advice for my children. Um, I have a nine-year-old son. I think the biggest one is to be curious and have grit. I think in the world, we're not in a world where a certain amount of knowledge gets you a long way. Knowledge is now commoditized. The end of the world where a fixed set of skills won't get you all the way because the skill set has to change over time. But what will be a constant is if you're able to learn, if you're curious, if you're willing to learn, willing to make mistakes, willing to learn from mistakes and keep that alive, you will get ahead. So that's the biggest thing I teach my son. That's great advice. We've got time for two more questions. Um, if we can, number six there and number five. I am Vanj Saluja, and I'm part of the Learner's Voice program. Uh, my question to you, sir, is that uh, we've been talking about platforms, digital platforms in uh, developing countries, uh, but the country I belong from, India, the uh, digital penetration is only 30 35%, 37% by the latest figures, uh, which also deprives a lot of uh, people, young people living in rural areas to uh, get access to education through digital platforms. So how are we trying to tackle challenges in areas where we are still not being able to penetrate digitally, uh, especially in areas such as uh, the rural areas of developing countries? Thank, Thank you. you. And we'll go back to the... Um, yes. Hi. I'm from Argentina, where we are leading an online uh, academy as well. And the question is, uh, especially in Argentina, people still trust universities to provide legitimate education. So how do we, from the private sector or from, I don't know, startup companies, uh, how can we give people that uh, trust uh, so they can, uh, that, that they will learn the content that that it's important for them and for their, for, for their future. Thank you. Um, so the first question was about rural areas? Yes, yeah, so I, we can't do everything, but I, I just this morning I met an impressive gentleman who downloads um, content onto tablets and then hands out these tablets in rural areas where there's no internet connectivity. 
And while it's not quite as good as being online, it's impressive to see these tablets being deployed around the world. They cost about 60 US dollars, and, and they're amazing. Um, I think the technology advancement will make these devices more commodity. And whether it be on and offline, the trend goes towards more and more online. So we, I like to skate, skate where the puck goes, as the saying goes, not where the puck is today. And with a massive increase of online um, access, I think online is a great place to be to start with. And the second question uh, was about trust. Most people think that the best way to get an education is to do it the traditional way, to go to a traditional university. Trust is the single biggest issue in my company. Um, my entire exercise of building university hinges on trust. And trust is slow moving, uh, but by having worked with over a thousand hiring partners to hire our students, and companies publicly declaring that they're willing to do this and building content with us, we've at least created some trust. But every single day I wake up and ask myself the question, how can I earn my students' trust? And the answer ought to be that I am honest, that I'm transparent, that I do my best possible job working with students, and that I keep innovating. So everything that's not perfect in, in our education eventually will be improved. Someone who uh, has spoken to me a fair bit about trust and how you change this cultural shift. Uh, I'd like to invite him now onto the stage to continue this conversation about where we take uh, education. Can I please call from the Bertelsmann Foundation, Mr. Jörg Drager, to join us here on stage. Hi, Jörg. So, Jörg, if, before we begin uh, our conversation with you to carry on from where Sebastian has left off, if you can just, just briefly in 30 seconds tell us what the Bertelsmann Foundation does. Yes, hello to everybody. We're a think tank. We do policy advice. We do it a lot in education. And usually we would worry more about people who are disadvantaged rather than those who have everything. So if you talk about lifelong learning, uh, we work for people who don't have any degree at all rather than those who want to go for an MBA at Stanford. So it's, it's quite interesting because one of the points that's just been raised is about trust and culture and societies believing that actually going down the path of going to a Stanford or a Harvard or just even a university in between right across the globe is still something that parents encourage a lot of their children to do. But do you feel that that's the path that you should be going to? Well, you see, on one hand, degrees are getting more and more expensive, and companies trust those degrees less and less. So the signaling power of those traditional university degrees is losing. Why? Because it's not a guarantee that you do a good job later in your life. And so when, when building up you know, something new, I guess your, your trust and reliability comes from the proof that you actually can do something with your degree. And usually you borrow brand from somebody who has proven that. I mean, you know, why is Sebastian talking about Google and others? You know, because they have a reliable brand. And so if, if he's delivering something Google wants, then it got to be good. And if you take the German apprenticeship system, I, I have some nephew who's becoming a car mechanic. He never would say, I become a car mechanic. He says, I work for Porsche because the stronger signaling brand is the employer he works for rather than the degree he gets. Then why is it that there aren't more people wanting to be part of or create a Udacity platform, for example, and they still feel that going down the mainstream university is the way to do it, if that's what companies like Google don't want? Well, I guess in the end you need both. I mean, for rational reasons and for psychological reasons. For rational reasons, before you, you actually become professional in, you know, in some programming, you better learn how to learn. And learning how to learn is not something Udacity really teaches you. I mean, that you've got to bring along. And that's the job of schools and universities in enabling young people in, in having the basis of teaching yourself something important. And then you go on and you build on that with, with nano degrees or micro degrees or others. There's also, I believe, a psychological reason. Because, um, you know, in our societies, I, you know, it's a broad international audience here, but um, somebody once told me, without a bachelor, you cannot marry. 
you know, we do have an expectation in our society for our kids um, that they better get a degree. And, and by the way, I answered that person, but without skills, you cannot support a family. And so in the end, we need both. You know, you want to fulfill the, the expectations of society, and a university degree seems to be part of that, but you better have the skills in order to do something job-wise and employment-wise later in your life. Sebastian, do you think that we are prepared enough for the challenges ahead? You talk about the technology and the rapid rate at which it's moving forward. Do you think that we're keeping up? No. So how alarming is it then? <laughs> so I mean, I, I live in this crazy dream world bubble called Silicon Valley. And I mean, if you would just look at the breadth of interesting startup companies, then I mean, I think we, we're leaving the world behind. And Udacity and Coursera and edX and a few other companies are our best attempt to level that playing field and help the world population. But technology is, I think I'm left behind. I, I'm not up to date anymore. It's moving so fast. It's, it's happening in Silicon Valley, but are there other parts in the world where they're keeping up just as much? I, I think I'm not keeping up. I, I, I'm falling behind. I need to get How trained. How is that possible? <laughs> You've created driverless cars. And... It's, it's amazing to see this exponential explosion. I mean, we should remind ourselves humanity, humankind is, is tens if not hundreds of thousands of years old, depending how you count. But almost every relevant, interesting invention that you hold precious to your heart, from electricity at home to running water toilets to penicillin to your cell phone to your car to your airplane have been invented the last 150 years. And that's the result of the book. The book allowed us to take information outside the brain and duplicate it error-free and spread it much more economically. And now we live in a world where we can even do more of that. And because of this, our jobs change from agriculture, where we do farming for hundreds of thousands of years, then briefly uh, industrial work, and then eventually office work, at least in the United States, 75% do repetitive office work. And as we get that machinized, we have all this free time, so we're going to be more creative as a result, as humanity. And that means I have absolutely no way to predict anything. Jorg, are you feeling the same? Do you think that we're not keeping up in terms of skills and where we are and where our ma mindset is? Um, I think there at least is a large part of our population that has a t hard time to keep up. You know, some are, you know, have everything, you know, from the brain and the opportunities and, and can. Um, but there is a large part of our population that will have a very hard time to move into this new era of technology. And, you know, look at self-driving cars and the discussion going on in the U.S. Um, about truck drivers being the largest group of, of, in the workforce. So can you retrain a truck driver to be a web programmer? That's probably going to be a significant and hard challenge. Um, and then you talk to those people and they say, well, we'll come to a better world, but it will take only like 30 years of shaking in. I don't know any politician who's going to survive 30 years of a population on a larger scale to be shaken in. I mean, that's why vice is so important. That's why all you are so important from earliest childhood on to adult learning. We have to change the mindset. We really have to change the mindset. And, you and think by, by the way, it, you, know, I, you know, just making one more point, yeah. I don't think it's all technology. It, it, because technology is freeing us, as Sebastian said, from a lot of repetitive tasks we never wanted to do. And there will be a lot of interaction work. What I mean by that, if, if you're today a, a, a physician and um, you spend a lot of time looking at uh, skin to discover skin diseases and some artificial in engine takes away that duty from you, you have much more time to explain your patient how to deal now with a skin cancer. And that's interaction work, and you've got to be trained for that. So I think, you know, it's not, there will be a lot of people who are developing technology and, you know, analyzing data on that, but a lot of jobs will give us more time to stress on the human aspect of our life and to interact more intensively with other people. And, you know, this morning we, we talked about in another session about teachers having more time to deal with a kid rather than standards and the doctor will have more time to deal with the patient rather than looking at x-rays. 
and it's, it's that change in the workforce that we also got to train people for. It's different skills needed. Some of them are technical, but not all of them. Is it happening on any scale? I mean, are there sort of concrete examples you can give in terms of if these shifts and changes are taking place somewhere? Well, I mean, we've, we've seen those changes, you know, continuously over the last decades, you know, with, with, you know, repetitive tasks becoming more and more important. I mean, you know, take the truck driver, um, now they spend less time looking at maps and they're driven around by intelligent navigation systems and they better spend their time chatting to the secretary when they work for UPS and making sure that the next contract goes to them rather to the competition. So now they need interaction skills and not only driving skills. So then we adapt as human beings as well. Oh yeah, I'm absolutely optimistic. It's just we've never seen adaptation so fast. Like, I mean, my grandfather had the same job as my grandfather's grandfather, and the family slightly moved on a little bit, and all of a sudden, boom, people don't have a job for a lifetime anymore. Like in one generation. And then soon we're going to have multiple jobs at the same time. I, I had a job about two years ago, for a day, I became an Uber driver. I decided I want to be an Uber driver for a day. And so I got there and got my training, which was no training, and, and then became a taxi driver. So we now we live in this world where the jobs become so much more fluent that I think we really have to change our thinking about stability and safety and security and, and, and learning and so on. But that's scary as well, because you walked away from Google and you walked away from a whole career to start something new. But for, for a lot of people, making that change, especially if they have a degree in something and they've been trained in something, making that sudden shift or change can be quite scary. Yeah, boy, I mean, that's where my DNA is a bit different. I, I love uncertainty. When, when everything is predictable, I, I feel bored. <laughs> uh, I at some point resigned tenure at Stanford. But I wish I could tell everybody how great the world is when you're learning, when you're exploring. As, as children, we learn so much, we try everything. And then for some of us, that gene, that drive to learn something new switches off, maybe at high school, because maybe high school is very boring. It never switches really on again. I wish we kept this alive for everybody all their lifetime. That's what I mean, shift our mindset. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I have one fan. <laughs> one person on my no, side. No, this whole room is on your side. <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> You're, let's talk a little bit more about lifelong learning. This morning we spoke on the panel about the impact of social media, for example, and that perhaps young people, millennials, are not learning as much. They're not picking up books. But do you think that's the case? Do you think that actually young people are inventing things, they're creating things, they're more innovative than we give them credit for? Well, at least it's much easier to be innovative and it's much easier to access information in the past. I mean, you can start building some cool app within seconds. In, in the past, you needed, you know, a workbench and physical material and it was hard to be creative. So, you know, the tools are there. The question is, is our education system leading young people towards curiosity and, and self-learning or are we, are we blocking them and their curiosity? And if, if you ask a five-year-old in the US, do you love school? It's like 98% say yes. You repeat that question at age 15 and 35% say yes and 65% say no. So we lose two-thirds of the young people in their learning experience within, you know, nine years. And, and uh, you know, that's for me the bigger challenge than the question is whether our curiosity lives in the digital world or in the physical world. Keeping people engaged throughout their Keeping schooling. Keeping people engaged and self-driven, not as a car, you know, as a person. Um, and, you know, we, we said before, the time where it was enough to know knowledge, that's, that's over. And you, you need to learn how to learn. And you also need to, to network to those other knots in the, in the intelligent society that help you solve problems collectively. And those are the skills we need in the future. And, and kids being a lot of social media, I mean, they know how to, to, to live in a digital network. They just got to use it more productively for, for learning, for peer-to-peer -peer learning, and, and for producing something together. And I was at some Malaysian university, and the professor says, I'm teaching a course in, in entrepreneurship. And uh, the task for the students is to think of a project and to find three people somewhere in the world and to realize the project together. 
And the, the student said, what happens if I don't find those three others? And the professor say, pitch again, you didn't do well. And then the professor said, if you raise, I don't know, a couple of thousand dollars in crowdfunding, you get an A, you don't even have to take the exam. Because he said, that's real life. You know, you think of an idea, you look for other people in your network, you realize it, you convince others for funding, and then you just do it. And it's, you know, social media offers you all the opportunities if we use it in a productive way. Let's uh, open up again uh, to our audience and get some questions for both Jorg and Sebastian. I've got one at the back, so two and four, number six. So we'll start with number two, please. And if you could stand up. Hi, I'm Sehama Lawami from Save the Dream. I have a question and a comment. The question is, how can you bring this education, which is free for everyone through, the, uh, through your university, to people who don't speak English? How can you advance them and open these opportunities if they don't speak English? And the other comment is, when you start, uh, you go to university, you learn a lot of things, and once you start doing many other things or learn any, many other skills, somebody will come and tell you you're not focused. So what can you say about that? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I believe, yep, number four, if you can ask your question. Hello, thanks very much. Uh, my name is Sara De Freitas from Birkbeck College, University of London. Um, with the major growth in students that's projected over the next uh, few years, how do you think we can maintain quality across the educational experiences that our students are gaining? Okay, and number six, I believe. Hey, I'm Steven Anderson. I'm an educator and a blogger and an author from the United States. I actually wrote a book on lifelong learning, so this is really interesting to me. So, uh, you know, lifelong learning is great for those of us who don't have to worry about the economic impacts of everyday life. And if we really want to have uh, a society that's built around lifelong learning, then we have to overcome the hurdles of poverty and, uh, and those kinds of things. So what do you say to that? Because many of these online courses aren't free or they're not uh, able to be accessed by those who are economically disadvantaged. So how do we overcome that hurdle of really truly making learning lifelong and free for everyone around the world? Thank you. I'll, I'll come back to the panel. Um, so uh, one of the questions uh, was, and I'll put it to you, Sebastian, was um, a lot of these courses are not in English. Uh, uh, um, they are in English, for example, but they're not in other languages. So how can you make it accessible to everyone? Yeah, mea culpa. Uh, we haven't moved fast enough. Uh, we have now a whole bunch in Chinese. Um, we have a few in Ara Arabic, uh, thanks to Google, I should say, and, and, and some in Portuguese. but. There's a long way to go, in my opinion. Uh, I wish there was just one language in the world. <laughs> is, there, is there anything more being done other than what Google has done to kind of make it more inclusive? Because you've said, you know, it's a basic human uh, right to have lifelong learning, and if whole sections of society are left out because... Yeah, so we've, um, we've entered uh, India, China, um, various Arab-speaking countries, including Egypt, uh, Istanbul, Europe, uh, Brazil, and... Um, hopefully soon Colombia, uh, and we're now moving into Spanish as a big language. Um, I personally would love to have a partner to do Arabic, uh, because I think it's so important. This part of the world, I think, could so, has so many talented and, and eager young people that I think should deserve the same access that I have had in my life. Um, the only excuse I have is we only have 24 hours a day and seven days a week, and as a startup company, we are on our way, but we're not there yet. But it's become, whoops, one, uh, yeah. but it's become easier. Uh, you know, on, on the one hand, there is a crowd. Um, people are helping each other translating stuff. And on the other hand, it's lots of video and animation-based learning these days. And that's easier to translate than if it was a full-blown textbook. Because, you know, it's self-explanatory in, in many ways. So even though there is the language challenge, it's at least, uh, it's not quite as much of a challenge than it used to be in the past. And Jörg, if you could um, address this uh, question as well about how do, you, how do you maintain quality, you know, at the rapid growth that we're, we're seeing at the moment? 
Um, that's a huge question because I don't believe that the usual mechanisms of crowd uh, um, quality control would necessarily work in education. And you need curation. And, uh, you know, I'm, for example, missing platforms where I can reliably find good material, curate it, um, where, where I know when I use, you know, that app or that video or that simulation that, um, you know, I'm not wasting my time. Um, and so I'm, I'm very much hopeful that the, the international community gets together and creates curation and platforms that everybody can use, both for technology and for content. And, and a question uh, to you both, if you can address it, is uh, the statement made by the gentleman um, just up there was that it's one thing saying, you know, have lifelong learning, but if someone's grappling with economic issues or poverty, it's not something that they can indulge in necessarily. Yes, so there are definitely issues. What we find in our data is that the early adopters tend to be people that they're more gutsy, more gritty, and more organized. And as much as we reach out to the world, um, the students that trust us right now are still early adopters and not mainstream. Having said this, we've made over 50,000 scholarships available to people uh, of different circumstances. We have scholarships entirely directed at women. We have scholarships directed at Syrian refugees in Germany, and any person who sends me an email, Sebastian, I'd like to study for free, gets a scholarship from me. It's my policy. Uh, I should say Thank on top you. of this, um, <laughs> it's only a small thanks, slither of students that even pay. Um, the students that pay us get various, various services. They get personal feedback, they get a mentor, they get career services. But about two million students um, every week come to us, study actively, and don't pay us a dime. And I like this because I think education should be available to everybody. And while I can't floor the expenses of giving all the free students personalized feedback because the company would go bankrupt, I'm still very happy there's a huge following of people, especially from the developing world, who enjoys the free content. Uh, Jörg, if you wanted to respond to that as well. You know, on the one hand, I really see it's the job for the government to also pay for lifelong learning for the disadvantaged. But, it, you know, the digital world brings something new um, for those who didn't have all the chances in the past um, that actually saves you money or makes you, makes you more valuable. Um, it, you know, if we look at the job market, 60%, um, at least in Germany, of people having no degree work in qualified jobs. So they, they have skills, but they just have no piece of paper. And by now, we start having digital tools in making those informally acquired skills visible and formal, and actually giving people who had no education a proof of their informal education with a scalable digital tool. And so it's not only the question of what do you pay in order to learn, but it's also a question, how do you make visible what you already achieved? And if, you, if it's visible and, you know, if it becomes like a certificate, you can go somewhere and earn more money. And we've been trying to do this or starting now this month with the hundreds of thousands of refugees having come into Germany and other European countries of having developed a video-based um, testing system that was expensive to develop but very cheap to scale that people get some kind of a certificate of saying, they have certain skills of a car mechanics or a nurse or other things um, after having gone through a couple of hours of video-based testing. And those tools just weren't available before. Beforehand, you had to go to a master craftsman, work three days with him or her, and pay 3,000 euros, and then you get a certificate. And now it's free. And suddenly your skills you always had become valuable to you. So really, it's not only a question of what you pay for education in the digital age, but also a question what suddenly becomes valuable, what you always had, but was invisible before. Let's go back to the floor now. I'm sure there's plenty more questions. Uh, number eight, number five, and uh, I'll take number two at the back as well. Uh, so begin with number eight, please. Thank you. Uh, quick, I'm Alex uh, from Argentina. Quick question for Sebastian. And you've been adapting Udacity since, since the launch. Uh, can you comment on the sustainability of your business model, uh, you know, considering the number of folks that actually get a nano degree? Uh, and now that you're, if, if I may say, more sort of an HR focused company, working with the companies developing those degrees. How sustainable is that longer-term 
And do you have another sort of a, a reinvention coming, coming soon? Thank you. I'm very happy to report that um, our nanodegrees are cash flow positive on the unit basis and sustainable. Um, we typically put about a half million dollars into development. We, we make the content really nice. And then we have a wonderful group of contractors that do all the mentoring for us. And when we put it all together, a student gives us roughly, give or take, $1,500 on average, cheaper in, in other geographies. And with that, we can recoup the money, which is great. Uh, we are still investing massively in growth for the company. In the last year, our paying student body went up by a factor of five. Um, so we see much more trust and confidence. Uh, but I believe the model is there to stay. I think we are outside the area where a startup company fears for life. We're now in the area where a startup company tries to, to build it up. And our biggest objective is, of course, to give back to the students as much as we can. And uh, we do this in the form of scholarships. We have our tuition is factor of 10 or so smaller than any comparable college and so on. Uh, and I believe uh, number five, please. Thank you. Uh, Hazar Yildirim from AFS Intercultural Programs. I'm very inspired by the possibilities of uh, what these opportunities can provide for people around the world. But the more I think about people getting their education on their own through uh, digital tools, I realize won't we be lacking the opportunities of actually being in a school setting, being able to interact with people from different cultures, people from different perspectives, and developing those soft skills which are very essential for people to survive in our globalizing world. And uh, you know, you get your degree somewhere in Doha, and then you get hired in the Silicon Valley, and you're dropped into this diverse community, and you don't have those soft skills to adapt there. So how do you think we can overcome this? And just one more remark there. Yes, maybe social media and through the courses, they interact with each other, but uh, people tend to create their own echo chambers and stay within those echo chambers. So how do we break that echo chambers? Okay, uh, and I'll just take one final uh, question, uh, if I can take it from number three, please. Hi, uh, Javier Gonzalez from SUMA. I would like to ask if you have thought of using this tool um, f to train teachers to improve uh, the quality of education. Thank you very much. So we'll, we'll uh, begin with that uh, question, just how you train teachers, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> we don't, yeah. but I think Coursera has uh, teacher training programs out, and there's various online training programs. In fact, I love the idea of training teachers in general because if done well, you get this amplification effect uh, for our training. Maybe look at the Arizona State University. I mean, they have a new category in personnel of people helping professors to be trained um, for, um, for classroom teaching in the virtual age. Um, and uh, it turns out, again, it's more a pedagogical question than a technological question. So it's not how to use media, it's rather how to personalize education, how to address the individual child or the individual student, and then use technology for doing that. And so it, it's, it's a massive task, but it's a pedagogical task. You know, the technology is, is becoming more and more self-explanatory. And I, I believe there was a question about, uh, you know, becoming a global citizen and working in one place and trying to adapt your skills somewhere else and the challenges of that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it, it, it's obvious that it's much easier to, to train people to learn math or programming um, online rather than to train them to become a better citizen or a global citizen. But I think the point of, of using digital tools is to give trainers and teachers and professors time for the essential. And the essential is human interaction. And why should I waste time as a teacher explaining the Pythagorean theorem for the hundredth or thousandth time in my life? Can't that some program simulation or video not do better? And give me as a teacher time to actually interact with the student and talk about values and respecting others and a global experience? I think that's one part of the answer. And the other is, that um, when education becomes a mass business and everybody is supposed to be educated more and more and longer and longer, we need also other tools, um, for example, virtual study abroad programs. I mean, if the number of students um, in, in universities in the last uh, 20 years or 10 years has tripled, we can't send them all abroad. 
but we can give them an experience with virtual studies that is at least much better than nothing. It might not be as good as the full international experience on campus, but at least, you know, working in an international network, they gain some of the experience. And so I think really time for the essential, for the human, and as much of the experience for soft skill, international experience, the virtual world, is a mixture that is at least better than what we have today. And before we wrap up, I mean, would you both say that the degree then is broken? I want to say something completely different, if I may. Sure. I've been here and I've spoke to many of you and I just want to say how much I admire all of you. I think every single person I've run into has a spark, has a mission, and knows something about education that the world doesn't know. And I just want to encourage all of you to fight as hard as possible. You are, in my opinion, the most important people in the world because education is the most important thing in the world. So please keep up with the fight and be as impressive as I've seen you in the last day. That's brilliant. Sorry. No, I no. Had to be said. I, 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 think I wanted to say it. No, you should. You should. The nun degree. Long live the nun degree. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't add anything to that, I think. <laughs> I think. I think that was a nice note to end on. You've both been incredibly inspiring. Thank you so much for joining us this, <laughs> for this session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.